Hello everyone and welcome to my review of episode 7 from The Witcher Show on Netflix. If you've missed any of the previous ones, you can check the playlist in the description. Also, this video may contain tremendous spoilers, so proceed with caution. Okay, with that out of the way, let's go over this episode, the name of which is Before the Fall, and let me tell you what I thought about pretty much everything. It's a joke. We open up with Siri performing arguably the least subtle theft I've ever seen. Where would you be headed, little thief? But it makes sense because she's a princess after all. Her days as a gangster are yet to come. I don't eat rat. Then she pronounces Skellige correctly. Skellige. Delivers her trailer line. This place isn't safe if you're alone. And it's the same as every other place. And we move on to Geralt. Or should I say we move back to Geralt because this takes place back in time, before Nilfgaard's attack on Sintra, which actually took place in episode 1, so this scene takes place before the first episode. And of course, Hansa Mermian is still alive. So they meet, talk, and suddenly Sintra and assassins show up, but then Ermian teleports them to safety. And we gotta talk about this. Can druids perform this type of magic? You know, like portals? <laughs> and is Ermian a druid at all in the show? I mean, I think he is. That line he had in episode 4, was it? Been advising the skeleton crown for years, a tad rough around the edges, but they're off the earth. Like me. Old and crusty. I thought that was a nod to him being a druid. By the way, wasn't Geralt's mom a sorceress and a druid at the same time in the books? Next up, we have Queen Calanthe, sure of herself as ever. Then Geralt shows up and says, I've been away 12 years and I planned on staying that way till you send eight men to kill me. So for those people who haven't read the books, I think it's one of those moments where you can begin to realize how the timeline of the show is actually structured. All the way back in episode one, we had the events of Renfri and Ciri in parallel. However, Renfri's timeline was much earlier. You can see it now because he wears her jewel on his sword and the fall of Sintra is about to come soon. Meanwhile, the events of Pavetta and Duni took place 12 years in the past from this very moment here. And in last episode, we learned that the dragon hunt was afterwards, but still before the fall of Sintra. Also, it was clearly after the Jin sequence. It's starting to clear up, I think. There's some more spooky destiny talk, the Queen does not want to give up her granddaughter, Geralt does not want to back down, but meanwhile, a woman cannot pronounce Skellige. What's so special about Skellige? So rightfully, Ciri steals her horse. Uh, back in the past, Calanthe is preparing a fake Ciri, but not that fake Ciri, another fake Ciri, and things start making sense even more. He argues some more with the Queen, but finally sees reason and agrees to leave. However, they lock him up anyway. Needless to say, a lot of what we're seeing here isn't how it goes in the books, but given the changes they've already made, they do need some extra changes to get things straight and, all things considered, they're doing it well, I guess. Okay, next up we move to Nazaire, and you gotta tell me, is this scene replacing what I think it's replacing? Or is it an addition to it? Or perhaps a prequel to it? So, in the second book, there's the whole drama of Yennefer cheating on Geralt right under his nose with Istrid. And even for a while, considering his marriage proposal. Then there's the arranged duel between the two men and the letters and so on and so forth. Now, based on me reading comments on my Witcher videos for the past five years, I can tell you that a good amount of people who read the books and who do not wish to romance Yennefer in the third game are motivated, at least to some extent, by the way she cheats on Geralt in that chapter. And I must say, it's not something one can easily overlook. But the point is, are they replacing that with what we see here in the show? Are they removing the whole cheating part? I must say, I do like this scene quite a lot, especially how they portrayed Istrid. So Yennefer comes back to him after all these decades, during which he spent a good amount of time trying to get closer to her, but she wasn't interested at all, and instead was fooling around with all kinds of different people. However, suddenly she wants to be with him, despite still finding what he does kind of boring, because apparently she too got bored by everyone and everything else, and finally realized that 
maybe Istrid was really the guy for her because, you know, he loved her for who she was before all that. But he's like, you know what, I'm doing something that fulfills me right now, and yes, I fell in love with the girl you were back then, but I realized that what you really love is power, so I can't do this. Take Vilgefortz instead. But seriously though, I quite like what they've done with Istrid in the show. I said so before in whatever episode it was, two or three, that I enjoyed the backstory of their relationship, which was not part of the books. However, if this episode is just a prequel to the story in the book, and in next season he changes his mind, and we see Yennefer sleep with Geralt by night and with Istrid by day and all that stuff, I think they'll kind of ruin what they tried to create in this season. Anyway, we also learn about Nilfgaard's communistic ways, if I may call them this way. Well, these people were starving before Nilfgaard. See, most kings only care about their cocks and their coffers. They look out for their people. Everybody gets something. The same thing, which tastes as if someone pissed in my cup. And it's refreshing, actually, after the end of last episode, where Fringilla made them sound kind of fanatical. Although, sadly, we'll come back to that in a bit. To say her off for me. She said you're the best student she ever taught. No idea where you got such a ridiculous notion. Okay, so Vilgefortz and Yen go to Aratusa, and if I remember correctly from the initial episodes, Tissaia treated Yennefer fairly well and ultimately had nothing but good intentions towards her. Not just Yen, really, but the rest of the students as well. Well, minus the whole eel business, I suppose, but uh, the girls didn't seem to mind it that much. Anyway, now Yennefer makes it sound like she had a real bad time at school and Tissaia was bad to her and the others or something. First she says this... Where's Tissaia? Tissaia can wait. Fine, I'll just follow the sound of crying girls. Then goes to her old room where a girl is talking to a plant and two others are making out and says this... Fuck that old bag. Then she proceeds to show them how much cooler she is than Tissaia by making drugs for them, and then something happens that I think makes no sense. Yennefer finds out that some of the girls are only there because their parents paid the school. <laughs> Your parents paid Aratusa. And they're even ashamed to admit that they didn't have a conduit moment. But you all must have had a conduit moment. We shouldn't be mixing herbs. We shouldn't even be here. Which, as described early on, is the first time their magical abilities manifest. Each one of you showed an aptitude for channeling it. Your conduit moment created a new ripple in chaos, reaching me here in Aretuza. But then immediately afterwards, she takes them to the eel power plant and tells them that they will end up there because they have no talent for magic. Just because you fucked it up doesn't mean we will. You! Come on. With all the magical talent of shoe leather, you'll have a home here forever, Blacella. Anyway, so it seems to me that it would be impossible for someone without a conduit moment to be used as an eel battery. I took away her control, but she still has power. She's a conduit for Aratusa. With all the magical talent of shoe leather, you'll have a home here forever. Anyway, Tissaia shows up again, and in addition to Nilfgaard, Yennefer now calls Aretuza a joke as well. <laughs> Nilfgaard's a joke. Look at this place. It's a joke. Meanwhile, Triss shows up, and we move on to the meeting of the sorcerers, who are discussing whether or not they should aid Sintra against Nilfgaard. The order that we have built up over centuries. You've rejected it all, Fringilla. We've simply charted a different path, guided by the white flame. That makes us cousins. Is this a Witcher 3 easter egg? If not, it's a rather awkward coincidence, because, as I said in some of the earlier reviews, this woman plays the cousin of this character in The Witcher 3. You also believe in forbidden magic, demonology, necromancy, fire magic. My favorite type of magic. Lesbomancy. Triss does not approve of necromancy, yes. Could you revive him? Maybe. If I actually practiced black magic. Haven't sunken that low just yet. 
Yennefer did it. Also, they seem to really be pushing the angle that had only Yennefer advised Nilfgaard instead of Fringilla, everything would have been different. If she'd taken it, I wouldn't be where I am today. Neither would Nilfgaard. If only Yennefer had gone to Nilfgaard with her at the helm, they'd still be a shitty backwater. <laughs> <laughs> it happened in the last episode, too. Tissaia has a bit of a monologue, the actress is good, I like the voice, I've said that before, and uh, it's no surprise. The Ducal Huntsman releases the hounds, they catch the fox's scent. Then, it turns out Geralt was actually in Sintra as it fell. And, as destiny would have it, he escaped right in time. Then we have that Nilfgaardian fanaticism I told you about, when this guy refuses to tell Geralt what he wants to hear, I am already saved. And so Geralt decides to kill him and ask again. Where is Cirilla? We shall be born anew. Thus it shall be. Watch for the signs. What signs these shall be, I say unto you. Next up we have Ciri calling Geralt crazy. God, what kind of crazy person talks to a horse? Easy peasy with our powers combined. Then she is assaulted by the people she thought were her friends and recites Ithleen's prophecy. I'm not quite sure what's going on during this scene. There is a desync between what she says and her lip movements. There are also parts that are sped up and slowed down and even reversed. Um, I think they're trying to imply that she's manipulating time and space. Verily, I say unto you, the era of the sword and the axe is now. The era of the wolf's blizzard. The time of the white chill and the white light is mine. The time of madness and the time of contempt. Anyway, there we have it. Episode 7 of The Witcher Show. A somewhat weird one for book readers, I think, but dare I say, weird in a good way. Given what they've done, once again, prior to the events of this episode, and how they plan on ending the season, I'd say that they did the best they could have in here. However, I'm also looking forward to hear what you think of all this and of all I said about it. Also, thank you very much for watching, special thanks to my supporters on Patreon and YouTube members, and until the review of the final episode, stay tuned and be good. You said she asked for me. No. I told you that she said you were her best student. <laughs>